Um, okay, we'll we'll just begin. Um, thank you everyone for for joining us today. And my name is Jake Lee. Uh, I'm assistant professor of new media art uh, here at uh, the School of Art here at NAU Northern Arizona University. And first, I uh, I want to uh, uh, express my gratitude to uh, to the donors who uh, donated you know uh, money to make this event possible. And I appreciate the the uh, cert, uh, the visiting lecture series committee here. Me, David, and Deborah and Kate are the committee members. And also, I um, want to express uh, thanks uh, for the school bar who support this uh, event and the College of Press and Letter. Um, all right. Uh, today, I'm really excited to introduce uh, Wang Xiaoyu. Yu. Uh, she's a cur curator from the Guggenheim Museums. And um, she uh, uh, recently she curated uh, Ural Industrial Biennial in Russia, which I believe the one of the uh, biggest uh, uh, art festival in Russia. And um, she curated two different shows at Guggenheim. Um, and uh, before she joined the Guggenheim Museum, she was the, a curator uh, at the Cadiz which is one of the very important uh, 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 exhibition space in San Francisco. And uh, as also she was curated at the CCA, uh, College of California College of Art. Uh, please welcome uh, Wen Xiaoyu. And um, uh, thank you for, thank you, yeah, thank you for joining us. <laughs> and um, all right, <laughs> Xiaoyu, you can right. go. Right, <laughs> sure, yeah, thank you, Jay Wook, for, um, inviting me to give this presentation um and uh i think we have very limit we have limited time but i did prepare a very big powerpoint i'm not going to talk over each slide for, of course because there's also a lot of just artist works that um i won't get into detail but it will give you a sense of the sort of visual presentations and also general curatorial thinking that i have and I have done a few Zoom lectures over the time of this pandemic. Um, I think I started to get a little bit savvy of how you know this technology works, but at the same time, it also feels really, really strange because there is not really much of an um, interaction. And I think talking to a computer myself feels very bizarre. Um, and also you don't really hear any feedback or you don't feel the vibrations and energies of people in the room. Um, so I would try my best to, I hope not bore you. <laughs> um, so, and I, I think I had a little bit of discussion with Jay Wook just to get a sense of what are things that people might be interested in and as students um, from your university would be curious to know. And I think we landed on something just to talk about, I guess, from my very own point of view, what does curating mean? Um, and also how does it entail in my work, both from an institutional and also an independent point of view? Um, because now I think, first of all, the word curation has become a buzzword that definitely left the very specific field of contemporary art to enter almost every sphere of cultural um, kind of, you know, in, in industrials. You will hear things that a curated playlist or a curated fashion line or a curated, um, it just simply means something that is, I guess, carefully selected with taste. Um, but of course, like, the word curation in the music, it, it does come from um, very much of a museum context, but more from a conservation point of view. It originally, originally means to care and take care. Um, so it doesn't really mean to select, um, but the meaning of course uh, evolved over the years and hopefully for a good way, for a good reason. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of background of where this is coming from. And then oh, um, I want to talk specifically about start with two projects that I did at the Guggenheim Museum. Um, and it comes from a very specific premise, um, also built into this history of the global 
art discourse at the Guggenheim. I think compared to other museums in, in the United States um, or in New York, Guggenheim, a very, Guggenheim have a very distinctive um, programming that gearing towards this idea of globalism um, that is also a term that emerged in the 90s, um, coincided with um, the concepts of globalization. And I think actually globalism in art somehow served as a reality check, a critical point of view to look at globalization. Globalization pretty much always is uh, a term that mostly closely connected to with economic trade and also um, uh, connections um, and politics. Uh, it has this very social political and also the rise of neoliberal economy. Um, so in a way that is pretty much now having a lot of negative connotations of globalization where our life and thinking and culture and everything is um, running towards a very hegemonic um, point of view because of the global um, economy, the global north, the economically more powerful um, uh, side of the, the world uh, easily dominates the global south where things are less privileged. And so there is this really problematic power position and versus, of course, the resource extraction and exploitation. So we already see a lot of negative um, real impact directly resulted from globalization. But in art discourses, globalism is something that um, came out with a very optimistic and romantic set of um, view. I guess in the 90s, you will see the rise of uh, international buy news that are also a reaction to the often very slow and tedious and bureaucratic planning of museum exhibitions and institution exhibitions. So by news also something come out of this more nimble and flexible, more responsive way of looking at contemporary art. And also there is this really, um, I guess, uh, romantic uh, view on a new kind of cosmopolitanism that artists could come uh, and gather at a place where bring in their own cultural backgrounds and specificities and creating this very utopic time and space to share ideas and all present a set of um, aesthetic um, reflections on the social political issues. So I just want to give a little bit of background because the discourse on local and global has now uh, re-entered um, many discourses, especially also with the complication of the rise of right-wing nationalism that is all over, you know, every part of the world. And um, that's also somehow a critique or our, our, our negative response to the globalization and its result. Um, so these are also some of the background in thinking about globalism in, at the Guggenheim, where a lot of these, um, you know, exhibitions are focusing on international artists and international discourses and how can you bring that into a museum context um, and also places like New York where itself could be considered very much as a cosmopolitan city. Um, so I was hired by the museum very specifically to take care of a new art initiative called the, we also have a very long name to acknowledge the donor it's called the Robert Etchen Hall Family Foundation Chinese Art Initiative. Um, so it's a, a multi-million grant um, sponsored by this foundation. I don't know if this is helpful just to also give the some of the um, younger students in the room where there's this very interesting private um, funding and patronage system in the museum world in the United States, which is a little different in other parts of the world, for example, in Asia or, or Europe. But in the United States, most of the museums, the majority of the museums are privately funded, meaning that you don't receive government funding. Um, technically, there's no 
I guess, taxpayers' money, if, if we can put it that way. And then there are usually three kinds of sources for private funding at a museum, at a given museum. First is uh, individual giving. Individual giving means um, patrons, um, usually art, art collectors who are affluent and would love to support cultural activities, in this case, in the museum context. And secondly is, um, uh, 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 sorry, um, secondly is um, in uh, company sponsorship. So that means when a commercial company, they usually would have a cultural brand, some big corporations, for example, at the Guggenheim, we have a series of exhibitions and acquisitions supported by the UBS bank. It's one of the biggest Swiss uh, international bank. And then we also have the Hugo Boss Award, which is supported by the fashion brand Hugo Boss. Um, and then thirdly, which is uh, uh, the, the way that how my project and exhibition is sponsored at the museum are from uh, private foundations. Uh, so individual uh, corporate sponsorship and private foundations. So these are how usually museums are funded um, nowadays for programming. Um, so for this, um, series of uh, art initiative, the foundation really would love to see new interpretations and engagement of artists from China, or we say Great China region, um, and how they, we might be able to provide a new image of Chinese contemporary art, which has pretty much now been uh, stereotyped also over the image of the rise of the market of contemporary Chinese art, and also all the familiar names that we might um, encounter in this discourse and oftentimes when we look back they are a rooster of purely male artists um, there's really any women artists in the mainstream discourse on Chinese contemporary art there are a couple of them so anyway there are a lot of sort of these background uh, knowledge that prompt me to think about these exhibitions and the two exhibitions I want to quickly talk about is um, Tales of Our Time and One Hand Clapping. And now when I think back, um, I actually address the, uh, I'm still trying to get used to this. Okay. Um, I'm trying to address this concept also. What does it mean by um, creating contemporary art exhibitions based on a national identity or our nation, nation state sort of um, framework. So now when I think back of these two exhibitions, um, I'm trying to give new interpretations or at least shed new lights on our understanding for the first exhibition is more a geopolitical kind of a geo geographic expansion or, or reconstruction of what we understand China is. And then the second exhibition is more from a temporal point of view um, to really think about how we perceive time and the relationship between history and future and how that you know, could define our understanding of what a place is or what a culture is. Um, so I will start with Tales of Our Time. The title actually come from, um, as you can see, I, cover, I, I featured a half of the cover of a, um, uh, a, a collection of short stories by a liter literary giant uh, whose name is Lu Xun, L-U-X-U-N, if um, any of you are interested in looking him up. He was a, um, he was a, a great writer, uh, a fiction writer, and as well as nonfiction. Uh, he's also, he was also a revolutionary figure. Um, he participated in many of the revolutions in the early 20th century to help the country sort of reposition itself um, in history. And he also thinks uh, storytelling is one of the most important ways um, to kind of teach people uh, a lesson or how can we learn from history. And in his stories, there are a lot of metaphors that looking also borrowing historical elements like a historical um, myth um, and fairy tales into you know describing his contemporary condition. So for me, I'm always interested in how artists essentially are storytellers um, and how do they you know explore um, the possibilities of using image and visual language to tell a story that is different from a, a, a writer, um, but essentially also have this very interesting relationship 
between image and word. Um, so this is becoming the starting point of the show. And I also, this is a group exhibition. I was thinking how um, these artists that were selected could each tell a story, but tell a very different story of what we actually assumed we would understand a place like China. And then of course, this overall thinking about globalization and how we're, uh, we felt like we are very connected today. This is a very interesting image that illustrates all the um, airline connections and also all the railroad and everything that connected the earth that is uh, animated. I don't have a video here, but it just gives you a sense of, you know, physically materiality in terms of a materiality point of view, we are very connected. Um, but then under these images of connection, we also have a lot of divisions that imposed by nation state and itself, its own sovereignty. Uh, this is a very funny image. It's actually um, a bunch of flowers and candles covering the Google uh, uh, logo in front of the old headquarter of Google in Beijing, which was ordered to close in 2005 um, when the country kicked Google out and banned it from you know the internet the great firewall in china also just to give people a little bit background china has a very strict internet um control over you know the usage of all these um american companies google is not accessible facebook um instagram um what's up a lot of companies that you are not be able to use just on the internet browser if you don't have a vpn which is an ip address that routes you out of the uh, internet within china that you can connect as if you are in a different place and maybe some of you also heard the recent um uh wars over TikTok and wechat where trump administration intended to ban them from the united states so these are all just examples of how these um our so-called connection and global connections are uh, tokens and being tokenized and can all easily swim by political um agenda and so all these under all these framework the first artist i thought about is kan shen who um you know is an artist uh she um was born in china but went to the netherlands early on to study visual art um and it was based in amsterdam after she finished school for a long time so she's primarily working in video and she's also one of the first women artists who used the medium of video to practice and in, in China. Um, so she has been also kept a very kind of uh, um, hermit style of producing, I would say practicing. Um, she has participated in uh, uh, multiple Venice Biennales um, with her work, but it, it was she was never really commercially um, kind of, um, you know, let's say commercially that successful. Um, but she didn't really care. And also she doesn't really produce that much every year. So when I went to visit her in her studio, she was telling me a, a series of new projects that, that she's been doing. It's almost like a, a, a visual essay where she became really obsessed and curious about all these uh, border uh, regions in China, especially in the Northwest and Southwest. Uh, where culturally it's very different from Han Chinese because it's closer to Central Asia, right? So they shared a lot of cultural roots and um, customs and that not necessarily what we would consider East Asian, but then uh, nation state wise, geographically and politically, they're of course part of Chinese. And they, you might also heard a lot of, a lot of the conflicts that in, in over that region. So, culturally and politically they're very complicated but she was traveling there also this is just an image and it's very old um work that illustrating sort of one of these city gates along the silk road um where you know travelers uh would pass through and these areas are were not considered as china at the time um there were all these uh, various small countries and kingdoms but it's sort of roughly overlapping where the artist had explored her work. Um, so this is um, 
So she went to some of these places where you see on the image of the left hand side, there is one of these ancient cities, but there's not really much of detailed archaeology uh, documentation of when these cities were built or who were occupying them and what these structures are and what kind of culture came from it. It just become a sort of a big blur. And the artist actually went to explore. It's almost like an anthropological trip with um, um, her, you know, visual interpretations of these places. And many of the knowledges that she uh, managed to get are from local oral histories that from you know, the farmers or, or people who lived there and passed it around generation from generation. So you can see roughly the wall structures of the city. And she deliberately took these photos with her iPhone and in this Instagram for square um, format also is to give a very personal touch of these very grandiose history. Because when we think about these history, we tend to put them in textbooks and make it very official and this intention for historicizing or desire to historicize. Um, and then it becomes authority, right? Even thinking about this bigger concept of nation state and think about um, who is the author and who have the rights to say what and what we need to listen and why we need to listen. So in this way, this is a very counter kind of uh, grandiose gesture where she just uses iPhone to take these photos. And then she made maps of these locations, again, based on her memory of how she accessed through these places to deliberately keep it very personal and subjective as well. And this is how it was presented at the museum where these photos, uh, she visited about over a thousand sites um, and then took photos of all of them over, you know, hundreds of photos of, of, of them and then made them into a slideshow where the images just constantly plays one after another in the loop. And then here you could see like a map that he, she illustrated and how these cities are, are accessible. Um, so again, like from a point of view of a Chinese person, these places and images are very alien to me. Like I have never visited these places. Um, can, can I claim to be culturally, you know, associate with them? Am I part of this or am I not part of this? So these are all the questions that, you know, the artists are putting forward. Maybe I'm as alien as any of you of these places um, and why do I, um, have to be in a presupposed position and have a certain connection or relationship with it. Um, and then the next artist is Chan Zhao, who is from Taiwan. Um, again, if you are familiar a little bit with the history of uh, modern China, you would know that mainland China has a very complex relationship with Taiwan, where it was um, occupied by Japan, um, become a colonial, colonial uh, colonial place and then um, after Japan left the National Party uh, took its headquarter after it lost the Civil War with uh, the Communist Party to based in tai Taiwan so ever since then it was separated from the mainland and had its own sovereignty but then also um, Nowadays, people from Taiwan are struggling um, with the constant threats from mainland China to imply all the economic sanctions and all these political pressure because um, it wanted to be back as part of China, but then people want to, their own independence since they have been living and, and, and operating independently or semi-independently for a long time. So again, this is a very con uh, contested place to really look into and understand how you know um, nation state and these concept of a geography and and, and, di uh, and identities are teased out. So for Char En, he was really interested in how you know um, common people, regular city dwellers, understand this part of the history and how they perceive it and how they live through it and how they embody it. So it's not just a outside view of looking inside, but it's someone who is actually part of this. Um, and he thought about taxi drivers as a perfect subject 
to speak about this. Um, she, he was particularly interested in taxi drivers who are a bit older, um, who has experienced and lived through these different periods of history. Um, so he would, he maybe in this picture you will see he was carrying his big microphone and cameras. So he would go on the street and, and hail a taxi and then order them to go to very historically contested sites. For example, this image, it shows the American, um, American club uh, in, in Taipei. That's where the uh, US military um, is based. So people who are soldiers are the only person who get access to go hang out there and they have fancy dance halls and restaurants and swimming pools and all these facilities. Um, it, it almost creates a little you know, a, a society within a very foreign country. And then, of course, this is the Memorial Hall of the founding father of modern Taiwan. And then this is also a, a, a tomb site where um, during the coup of uh, sort of revolution in Taiwan where people were assassinated and, and, and killed and then uh, just buried there. So all these sites, he ordered the taxi driver to go. And then as they were on the ride, he would ask all these questions and secretly filming them um, with an angle of the camera um, to the point that the face is not completely revealed. So the identity is protected in a certain way. Um, but then the stories of these places and also these histories start to emerge from you know, the, the conversations with these old, old men or old citizens. Um, so the result is a video where you, know, you, you can watch partially of it or, or in full length. And then at the same time, he made this very beautiful textile um, or, or what, what, what would you call it, like a, a, a flag. Um, there, it's full of symbol, visual symbols. Um, you can see in the center is actually an indigenous figure of uh, indigenous um, tribe women um, in Taiwan that you know, we often tend to forget. Um, that is a mountain region. There are indigenous uh, group of people there before the arrival of Japanese and before the arrival of the you know mainlanders. Um, and then these are a lot of also local fruits that represents um, the diverse agricultural kind of um, a richness of the region. And then these figures are also representing the construction workers and laborers. And of course, these are images and figures of the soldier. Um, and then here you see the pole where the flag is hung actually represents the eagle claws of you know the American kind of uh, symbol. So everything is, um, did, everything is condensed into this imagery. And then what I didn't show in this uh, slide is there's also another vitrain table the next to it where the artist give a very detailed log and of what each symbol represents and what is behind it and what the story. And also because this flag is handmade with uh, fabric and embroidery, and all these fabrics are also handpicked by the artist and connected to a lot of the local traditions. So there's a sample of all the fabrics that is also able to become an index of explaining all these cultural specificities. Um, and then I think I might just skip a few artists because I realized I can start to talk like nonstop of these works. Um, and uh, so yeah, this is Sun Xin who is from Northern China, Northeast. So it's like a completely different region where it is also very close much to Korea. Um, and there is a, a very rich uh, coal uh, mine in, in, in the region historically, but because of over extraction and over exploitation, now all these coal mines are empty. They don't have any coals. So they've been turned into almost like a theme park or historical museum where people could go visit and see these big industrial infrastructures and get, getting an understanding of, you know, how these things are being extracted and how that supported industrialization of the country. So Sun Xun, he works mainly in animation. And these are just drawings from his animation that is worked with ink. Um, 
and there are many again there are a lot of visual metaphors that talking about the relationship between history memory and also the coal mines and the revolution and religion um and this is a very interesting image of you know how the train is now being seen as a very outdated technology in junk's position with this uh, momath is also a representation of an extinct animal so this is how it was presented at the guggenheim where the animation is projected onto a hand painted mural um, on bark paper, which is a very specifically handmade uh, tree bark um, paper. Um, so you, you can't really see sort of the animated part, um, but this is how the work is shown. Um, and then I wanna talk about this work because it became sort of a sensation um, for the exhibition, it's from the Jew Sun Yuan Peng Yu called Can't Help Myself. And it is a big robotic arm where the artist modified. And this is just showing some of the drawings that they made when we were thinking through this installation. And another drawing of how they modified the head of this robotic arm. And again, more computer rendering. And this is the actual presentation at the museum. So I can show you a video um, where I just find can you see the internet browser because maybe i have to share a new one hold on a second um yeah i would just i want to pull out a internet video to show you guys because there's so many video documentations online for how this work is being um, presented um and let's see Can you see the robot? Yes, we can see it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I couldn't. So I don't think there is sound of this video. Um, but anyhow, so you can get a sense of how, you know, this was operating. Um, and this arm was programmed by the engineer that the artist collaborated with. And it just repeatedly does this action of sweeping this pool of blood looking liquid into the center. And there are sensors on the ceiling where this room was constructed. Um, and then, so the idea is as soon as this liquid oozing out of this area where the sensor was controlling, the machine will be activated and scoop them back. And while they're under control, it would do this really bizarre dance. It would just lift its arm and, and moving um, in the air. So this work particularly speaks to this idea of surveillance. Um, I will show you another one that is filmed in a much later stage of you know, the presentation where you can see, oh, this has sound, where you can see um, sort of the backside oh, of the room has been completely covered with the splash of this liquid. Um, so it also have this really, really visceral uh, uh, impression. And it's almost like uh, a very violent um, kind of scene. But again, I was just saying that this art, the artists are really looking into these ideas of surveillance um, and particularly of border surveillance where certain things are allowed to pass the border and certain don't. And then of course the color and the texture of the liquid imply the idea of um, oppression and, and violence. And it's, you know, positioned in this giant glass room um, where people can only watch it from outside. So this machine also has this really weird double um, side of being uh, captured as if it's a big creature or animal inside of a cage um, doing very scary things while you're on the verge of, you know, a proximity of danger. So um, this is definitely something that becomes so popular. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Stacy. Um, I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. Um, hold on, I will do a presenter view. Um, 
so I know what is coming up. And so this work became really popular and actually got a lot of hits. And there are so many videos uploaded on Instagram and ev everywhere. And also the work was reconstructed uh, and represented in the Venice Biennale last year um, as part of the uh, theme of uh, may you live in interesting times um so just wanted to give you a sense of that and then i will go on also uh, skip a few works this is an artist from hong kong Chen Kingwa. he did a very immersive installations which these are all renderings but the overall effect is these texts would pour out from the actually the front video onto the ground and as if you are immersed in this um environment and the effect is realized with six synchronized video projectors um, aiming towards the floor. Um, there's also a lot of specific culture, culture context of this work and then we have Yang Jiang group who created this Chinese garden on the balcony of the Guggenheim with this exotic not exotic, but non-native um, plants like bamboos into New York City, where they also create these tea ceremonies and people could come and enjoy you know, tea as they wander through the museum. So overall, the show really is putting in all these um, cultural uh, uh, characteristics into question. Um, on the one hand, really destabilize people's stereotype of a place, but on the other hand, is really expanding the understanding of a place. So hopefully these artworks could provide an image, but the underlying current is all these contentions and you know, um, uh, complexities and complications of history and places that you know, are constantly in the play in 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 the realm of non non identified possibilities. So the next show after that, as I I talked about earlier, I was trying to think about you know how China now is being perceived, especially in the United States, as something that is imminent is coming in an imminent future, and this something that a country that is rising, and particularly in the narrative of this um, threat of uh, economic, economically so powerful and going to take over the United States. So it's not so much as the Cold War era where it is an ideological war. And I don't feel like today is still about ideology anymore because as you might know, China is now a very uh, highly capitalist society. Um, but it's really about you know American, America losing its foothold on the global stage where um, this fear is on the one hand self-generated but on the other hand is really being projected so this idea of a rising country coming to grab us as something you know a future monster is what i find super interesting and then of course this is all related or connected to the techno a technocratic way of organizing society and how in order to control the future in order to have power over the future, you must um, be advanced in technology and science. And this is nothing new. This is the same logic during the Cold War. Um, and these are just some of the posters also during the Cultural Revolution period in China when it was really catching up with the world, how it emphasized and illustrated the importance of industrialization and, and technology. And then of course, today we're experiencing all these discontent over the hegemony of technology where you know we're we're pointing over towards the singularity while we're using the same device while we're exploiting the factory workers um you know having all these toxic electronics while you know excavating all these mines in africa um so these are just some of the underlying condition to think about you know what how do you understand um, a place as like it's in its future tense and where does future entail? And then the title of the show is called One Hand Clapping and it has a few layers of meaning. And I don't know if you're familiar with this phrase, uh, but one hand clapping is a saying, a teaching in um, Zen Buddhism to lay out a few, you know, there are a series of these questions. They don't intend to have an immediate answer uh, but they are tend to use the, as um, thought experiment. The question is asked as we know the sound of two hands clapping, but what is the sound of one hand clapping? 
So it's also really to train your um, thinking from this habitual area to a place where uh, different imaginations and possibilities could emerge. And then also one hand, this image of one hand is also a lone figure. So it's also kind of signified how artists are working today as someone really go against the mainstream and question the mainstream of where the society is heading and how optimistic we are with technology. Um, so it's more playing this role of, of critiquing and, and criticizing. But when you are criticizing, you're often in a very lonely place um, when you don't agree with the majority of you know, the society. Anyhow, so these are all sort of the background story of where the second exhibition came about. And then, of course, when we speak about uh, the future, we have to think about the past and also how uh, think about how time is never really a linear in a linear fashion. Um, and how can we connect to these perceptions and concept of time? I was recently working with a Peruvian artist um, who told me a very interesting Indian um, cosmology and how Indian people uh, describing time and the relationship between future, present, and the past. So for them, um, the past is in front of you and the future is behind you while the present is now and gone. And it's really interesting because this, how they see the past is in front of you because it already happened. So you can see it and you can learn from it while the future is in your back because you don't know and it's unknown and you can't see it. And the present is now and gone is more you know, easy to understand and comprehend. So um, these different perceptions of variations of time, understanding of time, have provided much of my, you know, inspirations and in thinking for my curatorial projects as well. Um, anyhow, so I would just keep going. So this is a very interesting uh, woman painter from China, where a lot of her aesthetic and figuration um, and storytelling came from these very Asian texts, um, where you see the demons and creatures that are full of imaginations. Um, so you kind of can see the shadow of these uh, creatures in her painting where she mostly imagines these contemporary figures, but also in a very strange time and space. And also a lot of Chinese old legends inspire her work as well. And this is the moon fairies and the bunny, you no, know, the rabbit who lives with her. And it's a story about immortality and sort of the cautionary tale of how you reach immortal, you wanted to be immortal, but the punishment is you become very lonely um, and you only able to, you know, have contact uh, with the earthly world one, one, once a year. And then of course the artists um, also have these very interesting observations of everyday uh, culture and also how people finding um, sort of interests and uh, pleasure in these everyday activities um, she started to follow these, uh, you know, in sort of like the Chinese Instagram um, social media sites where people would collect these images of these weird looking vegetables, uh, particularly carrots and radish, and then uh, have this sort of morph the shape and have this very hu humorous um, outlook. And then she started to imagine what if these carrots also have life and having a picnic on their own. So she actually made these Cass Brown's carrots and also the Cass Brown basket. And then we placed them in the Guggenheim Museum. I didn't really have featured installation shots of these. I just thought that um, it will also be interesting to focusing on the process of how these works are made. And for Wang Ping, a Hong Kong based artist who recently sort of blown up after the presentation at the Guggenheim, he had gone on to have solo shows in Kunsta Basel in Switzerland, as well as the Camden Center in London and a few other places. He also works primarily with um, animation. I really encourage you to look him up. He has, he came from a non artist background and his early work, all these animated work are all accessible on Vimeo um, under his own um, you know, studio where um, you can just watch them for free. 
but now since he became sort of a main more mainstreamized as a professional artist the newer works are not really on the internet but anyhow Wang Ping uses animation as a way of storytelling and his story uh, imagines uh, uh, Asian and the senior populations in places like Hong Kong and also sort of end of life care um, and how that interact and intersect with technology and how you know technology are really leaving the senior people behind um, and the relationship between uh, melancholia memory and also the constant updating of technology and then we have Ling Yiling who is an artist now based in New York, uh, but of Chinese origin. Um, his work really was thinking about this concept of monad, uh, which is also a religious concept from Leibniz, which is a German philosopher of how, you know, each of us in the universe and everything can be reduced into a monad where these monads inter interact with each other and then creates connections. Um, so he was thinking about how to really pursue um, and giving a picture of the Chinese American, Asian American uh, communities in and working and living in the United States today and how they are having this super complex uh, contradiction in terms of their identity and presentation. So he thought about collaborating with Jeremy Lin if you are interested in basketball and NBA, you might know he used to play for um, Brooklyn Nets. And I think he is the, he was the only Asian American player in the league. Um, so he has this very legendary kind of coming age story about her, him being rejected constantly um, by being stereotyped as Asian, um, therefore cannot play basketball, uh, to that he was a superstar of a all-star game um, and that became overnight famous overnight and also it became immediately a hero image of the Chinese American community um, and how and at the same time he is a Christian um, he was raised super religiously um, but then he would have the most outrageous outfit in these games with his mohawk you know, hairstyle and a very um, uh, flamboyant sort of style. So I think the artist was really interested in sort of his life story in thinking about how, you know, these images are being portrayed in popular media as well as in people's life. So what we did was a very interesting um, intervention into the Guggenheim's architecture where during the changeover of the museum, um, we flew a drone and dropped a basketball from the ceiling to the floor and documented the whole process. And I can play this video for you too. You can see, and it has the sound of the drone where this you know, footage being incorporated into the video of the artist that is presented ultimately in the exhibition. And there is also, as you can see in this image, um, there is a VR component involved into the work where in the VR, I can just describe you what, what you'll see. Um, you will see in the perspective that Jeremy, the basketball player, the figure uh, was humongous and in front of you. And he slowly walked towards you and approached you and then he pick you up then you start to realize maybe you're in a position of the ball and then he would drop you a few times and then throw you out so you landed in a basket um but in the whole process because it was rendered in 3d and in virtual reality you can feel the dizziness as you were rotating um mid air and also sort of um, feeling these uh, really weird disorientation. But I, the artist was using this as a very humorous approach to ask us think about and also possibly feel about if it's possible to become the ball and standing in a very different position. And if so, why it would be so difficult to understand a different identity and also to understand what does it mean to be 
uh, other people that are different from you. Um, so this is the work. And then, of course, we have Cao Fei, who's probably the most well-known um, artist, younger generation coming from China today. Her recent work has a very strong focus on science fiction and sci-fi, and it's and also its relationship with the history of science um, and history of technology in China. So this story is about, essentially, according to the artist, it's a love story about a couple, young couple working in a distribution center that is fully automated. So there's no other workers besides the two of them and the robots. Um, so they obviously had this very intimate relationship as they're the only human companion of each other. But then there are always these awkward interactions and communications between the two because they forgot how to interact with each other. And of course, there's also a lot of dream sequence where this is the reference of the opera dance that was popular during the Cultural Revolution period of China that elevate the image of the workers and the working class. Um, so these are kind of incorporated into this super um, bleak and sci-fi looking facility. And this is also the storyboard of the film. I just thought that would be interesting to show you. And I also wanted to say that all these artworks are commissioned particularly for the Guggenheim. And what does that mean? It means it was non-existed before the exhibition and before the concept. Um, it was a constant communication with the artist and came up with ideas of what, you know, these works would be uh, interesting to present in the context of Guggenheim, also in the context of these exhibitions. So the next, we don't have much time, but I would like to quickly, um, talk about the Ural Industrial Biennial of Contemporary Art, which was the main project that I did last year in Yekaterinburg, Russia. Um, and the theme of the Biennial is called Immortality. Um, this is like an apple that the Biennial organizer made for the opening, uh, which they laser cut, I suppose, the word immortality onto the apple on the other side, and there are other apples that are said in Russian. Um, anyhow, I would give a little bit of a background of this uh, ideas of immortality and where you're coming from. So really think about, you know, of course, immortality has very loaded meanings in religion and also in other cultural contexts. But most importantly, it was also a reaction to this obsession of pursuing immortality in the real sense by these tech companies, for example, and tech tycoons like computer, uh, uh, like um, uh, these uh, super rich and uber rich class where they actually put money to these experiments and research into making us and making, making human um, really physically immortal. But then there's also this idea of digital immortality where there are certain facilities and facilitations and technology could invent it where to preserve our cognition, cognition and also memory and you know the brain, essentially even your body could uh, wither age and die. Um, so these are all real research that the Silicon Valley is spending shitload of money and doing but at the same time there is this tendency of what i spoke a little bit earlier about how humanity and we are all heading towards a singularity where all the history will converge in one point um, and the singularity is also the moment where supposedly we will reach a superhuman stage where a lot of uh, post-humanism um, theories and discourses are also focusing on and uh, the transhumanism, posthumanism is also something that it has gained so much momentum over the past decade. Uh, but at the same time, it goes hand in hand with these tech speculations or trying to turn the old fantasy into a reality. So the exhibition essentially is thinking from these points of views and um, I guess angles to really work as a critique on our relationship and our, you know, uh, 
increasing reduced imagination, increasingly reduced the relationship between life and death, and how death is being, you know, um, put into a place where it represents darkness um, and also weakness and something that is a disease needs to be overcome. While uh, the place of death had meant so many different things um, before we enter a hyper accelerated age for tech up uh, euphorism. Um, so the exhibition is also at the same time a critique on modern technology but you will not really see anything that is high tech in the show per se. I deliberately didn't want to engage with any so-called new media art or um, anything that you know engages VR or AR. Um, so it really presents this idea of technology is not a new thing. It evolves and adapts into different things at different stages of human civilization. And um, it is not a, something that we can limit our imagination and confine them into just tablets and computers and, and being defined and envisioned only by a few individuals in the Silicon Valley. Um, there are many different stories of technology that have been forbidden, omitted, and erased in many different cultures in its uh, history. Um, so one other important so source of this exhibition is uh, a book um, by philosopher Yu Kui, Y-U-K-H-U-I, originally from Hong Kong, but was based in Europe for a long time. He recently returned to Hong Kong to teach at the Hong Kong University. Um, it's called Concerning Technology in China, and he coined the term cosmotechnique, uh, which is a new concept that he invites people around the world to really trace the cosmology and the origins of different origins of technology in different cultures. He thinks that our current modes and dominant modes of technology, this Western uh, imagination of technology is on one way, uh, one imagination that have a European genealogy but dominated the world today. But then in many different cultures, there were different origin stories of what technology meant and its relationship with the human society and also nature. So these are the things that had, we had lost or forgotten or simply being now seen as backwards or superstition or barbarian. Um, but yeah, so it's also a very speculative uh, position where we would go in, go back into these origins of culture and its relationship with technique or technology to look for possible answers for some of the impasse that we are having today with modern technology. So these are just some of the, um, this is me with the Biennial Commissioner, Alyssa, um, and the Biennial took place in two venues. Uh, venues. One is the Rural Optical Mechanical Plant, and then it's the uh, second venue is the Collision Cinema. I don't know if you, any of you are familiar with the Soviet history, but Ekaterinburg is a very, very interesting place. It's in the Ura region, but it's located on the border of where Europe meets Asia. Half of Russia is on Europe continent and half of it is on Asian continent. Um, and it was, had been an industrial city since the Russian empire. Um, and then it produced all the munitions during the war. Um, and also it was completely closed off during the Cold War era because there was all this top secret of engineering and technology there. The city is, um, you know, uh, spotted, covered with all sorts of industrial leftovers and traces of these mega factories that now looks like just gigantic old uh, you know, dead corpse of giant animals. Um, so Alyssa, the commissioner, she was from there. She's from there. And she established the Bayanu in 2010 with the intention to revive uh, these old factory facilities and also to uh, use contemporary art and help revive the cultural scene locally. Um, so it's a very non-conventional space. It's a very, very different from Guggenheim where it's all white and pristine. Um, but you can kind of get a sense of 
um, the, the feeling from this image, where is the entrance of this uh, factory building. It has very narrow hallways. Each room is uh, a workshop. And uh, optical mechanical plant is particularly commissioned to make anything have to do with lens. So from, um, you know, microscope, telescope to cameras, but of all scale, there are these giant industrial cameras, but also for weapons that are aiming, you know, these um, eyepieces. Um, anyhow, so the show actually featured 75 artists and artist collectives internationally, and about 30 of them from Russia, different parts of Russia, and the rest are from, you know, different regions. I have a very heavy focus on a artist from non-American and non-European context. Um, and this is just to give you an overview of the floor plan and the entrance you saw earlier was around here. That is the entering, you know, this is the uh, plant, the factory floor plan, and this is the Coliseum, which is the cinema floor plan. And they're actually a bit distance from each other. This is more in the suburb and this is in the city center. And also the way you navigate through the factory, it's, each of these little details you can see is in one artwork. Um, it's a very linear um, one route uh, path that I also tend to do with my exhibition. Um, I like to create this very distinctive way of storytelling where you encounter each artist and each work in a very specific um, position and also how it relates to all the works around and in relation with each other. Again, like, I feel like we're running out of time uh, just to sort of walk you through some of these images of works. Um, this is a piece by New York based artist Jill, Jill Megid. Uh, Megid. I don't know if you know of her work, but I find this piece really astonishing. And she also made it mm, specifically for this location. So this is a rifle eye piece where you would see from any military devices that it was also specifically commissioned during the Iraq war. Uh, and it has a very, very interesting engraving on the body of these things where it was quoted from the Bible that particularly talk about um, enlightenment light. I don't remember the exact um, you know, quote because I don't practice um, you know, religion, but the artists find these pieces on eBay where each of these quotes, uh, there's a number engraved on these um, lenses and you can find a correspondent quote in Bible, uh, where literally basically something saying like your, you know, your, your, your destiny is guided by God and all this. Just imagine when the soldiers are looking through these lenses as they were shooting their victim. These are the things that they're actually having in mind because this is what Jesus is guiding you to do. Um, so, so these, these lenses now become sort of vintage pieces you can actually acquire on eBay for maybe $1,500, something like that. And of course, the artists find it super ironic and it's super, you know, um, visceral in this context. And considering this factory in Russia also produces things like this. So in the meantime, instead of having these, uh, a machine gun, she finds a book um, by a Russian author which also talk about the relationship between light and enlightenment, but in a you know, non-religious way, and also it's a novel. Um, so the, the meaning of the work is pretty much self-evident um, in terms of how do you interact with these concepts and you know, it's through war, violence, or through knowledge and reading. Um, so that's a very, and there's a very crazy story with this work because the lens got stolen, um, towards the end of the exhibition, and it was a very meticulously planned crime um, because the local, we suspect there are local Russian young people who were really interested in the concept of this work. They actually brought over a fake lens and replaced it with the real one and put the fake one onto the book. So the guard didn't immediately 
realized <laughs> the work was, you know, super, you know, uh, uh, replaced. And so we, we couldn't really catch. And there's also, again, it was not a museum context. It was this abandoned factory building. There was no surveillance, no camera, no, you know, security footage and whatsoever. So it's just gone. Um, anyhow, that was also a very interesting sort of a detail of how the artwork itself become part of the narrative into the story. Um, and then, of course, the insurance company paid for the artist and, you know, reimbursed to her. Um, but the lens now is forever gone. <laughs> who, who, whoever knows it's in like, you know, who's home in Russia, <laughs> some kids house um but yeah here the, there's a view kind of giving you to look into uh, through it into you know the gray sky of Yekaterinburg and now you can just see some of these images of the venues and these tiles on the wall they're really just naturally sort of peeling and then these paintings by a Moscow um painter who imagined sort of the, the, the leftover of the classrooms after being abandoned after the Chernobyl nuclear explosion and how they, you know, continue to sort of have a life of their own. But the first section of the exhibition really was trying to give an image and a story of the violence of technology uh, in a nutshell. So this is a very famous piece by Bruce Connor that features archival footage of the nuclear explosion and mushroom cloud in a company with very beautiful symphony. So this euphoria of, you know, height of technology intervention. And then this is a contrapiece by Peter Watkins, uh, a British uh, documentary filmmaker who made a mockumentary. That's what he calls it, is illustrating. This was broadcasted by BBC in the 80s where he actually uh, imagined a devastating um, result or event if there is a nuclear bomb being dropped um, in the UK and how people, you know, how the street will look like and people burning and all this. Um, even though we have a lot of footage of, you know, you know Hiroshima when the bomb, it's, it's aftermath, but there was not really any footage when the event was taking place and happening at the minute. So this is sort of the artist uh, imagination on that with all the special effects and etc. Um, the film was commissioned by BBC, um, but then after it was made, it was banned by BBC because they doomed its being too violent. Um, but then later it participated in many film festival um, and then it somehow gained fame in the film festival um, circle and later BBC decided to broadcasting it as well. But anyway, this is another installation by a Russian artist uh, based on the game Chernobyl, a video game, um, where you can explore in the sort of the left aftermath of the disaster, some more views. Um, this is a beautiful work by a Japanese photographer. Um, it's sort of also, she went into a village where was impacted by the nuclear explosion and the tsunami after that and how people navigated in the village of, I think, only a few hundred residents, um, the sort of the day to day, and it's hauntingly beautiful. And it, they're like printed and sort of naturally drooping over these wood frame. It's kind of the forest of an Im image. Um, more. And then we have some Russian artists. And then this part is sort of, I have this little obsession of butterfly as a metaphor to talk about immortality. Um, and its relationship between life and death, and also how it become the subject matter of many artists and um, and writers' um, inspiration for you know speaking about these issues. And this is a very beautiful old work by Diana Thatcher. Um, this is a very beautiful piece by Cristina Lucas, a Spanish artist, where um, it's this uvo shaped room and it's really talking about the synchronization of time of globalization where again like we're heading into this synchronized one point where these clocks they're placed one next to each other and they're deliberately being set uh, four minutes ahead of each other and then there's this ticking sound so the whole entire room is uh, represents 24 hours of 360 clocks but then you can just hear these really beautiful rhythmic sound but at the same time it's a very bleak pristine space as if our contemporary reality today and everything is erased 
Um, and this is a really nice work by Paula Madini talking about time um, as a metaphor. Anyway, um, it's just, you know, we have 75 works. I'm not going to go into all these details. I want to just sort of give you a little bit of sense. This is really amazing work by a Russian collective where it's a fake floor. And as you walk onto it, there's an air pump underneath it. So it's as if you're walking on like a very shabby, soft surface. And there's this really bizarre, like a visceral feeling. Um, and they were also trying to imagine a world where human has left and gone. Um, these are just the footprints. And there was this AI or maybe an alien sort of have its own uh, life that is breathing, but you never know the shape of it. Um, oh, so that's like probably end weird. I don't think that was the end of my slide, but somehow it ended here. Um, yeah, I don't know why. Let's try again. Hmm. Why I just go back to the beginning? That's really strange. But anyway, we can just quickly, because I think we should probably wrap it up. Um, I can just quickly show you some of the images that just to give you an overview of the binary. Um, that's where we stopped. And um, yeah, I was, this is also another very beautiful work by Taiwanese artist uh, Xu Jiawei. Um, he was obsessed with this mythical figure, this frog king that local people would pray to. It's like a fairy um, and for good luck and you know all sorts of prosperous thing, prosperous thing. And also it's supposedly uh, the frog used to live in a temple in mainland China. But then during the Cultural Revolution, the government destroyed the temple because at the time, all religion is forbid was forbidden, it was considered something, you know, anti-revolutionary. So the frog had to be forced to move to Taiwan um, because it lost its home, um, the temple. And then the local Taiwanese started to worship him and build temples for him. So he, you know, relocated himself. It's a very interesting story. Um, but then the artist was interested in, you know, sort of really how can we communicate? In what way can we communicate? And what's the role of technologies playing in that to communicate with spirituality and something that is divine and so-called, you know, in a different realm, rhyme. So he actually invited these masters, these guys you see in the green jacket, where they will perform these ritual, because one of them supposedly will be able to communicate with the frog king there is a series of ritualistic movements where they would call the frog king and asking him to appear and then ask him questions as you know a process um, there's al almost like shamans but you know a little different um, so they conducted this ritual in a green room where there is uh, uh, cameras censoring the movement um, and then the artist rendered the sensors from computers and you know the, the the surveillance cameras and the rendering and trying to map out the movement of the frog king um, and also the questions that people were asking so there's this really interesting speculation and then the video was projected at, from two sides and one side is the ceremony and a ritual with you know no background in a green area and green room and the back is the questions that they asked the frog king and also the scenario and uh, a, a visual that the frog was answering. So the question was, what was your original home look like? What was the temple look like before it was destroyed? And then there's the computer rendering based on, you know, this ceremony where the frog king is supposed to answer the questions. Anyhow, um, then we have more, I don't know, there's a lot of concepts and in, including this mural pathway that are surrounded by reflective materials. This is my curatorial intervention into the space um, that also served as a portal, um, entering a different sort of um, realm from one side to the other. And there's a very uh, uh, deep philosophical kind of 
background into the making of that too. Um, uh, I think and then we, we are, um, yes. Questions, so if you, <laughs> uh. Yeah, so I'm just gonna go through the slides and I also, I'm happy to answer some questions from people if you wanna know, you know, specific um, work or any other bigger curatorial um, sort of, I don't know, ponderings. <laughs> there, there are a few questions in the chat. I, uh, I guess. Oh, I see. So uh, hold on. I don't know how can I find the chat if I'm still in the screen share. Okay. So um, do, you guys, do you have a certain logic or strategies for space allocations and lighting controls to deliver your intended narratives or how space and architecture affect your curating in terms of exhibition design? Uh, so I think it's, it is in terms of the your uh, the Uller Industrial uh, uh, Biennial. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, so. For Ural and for all the major exhibitions that I worked with, um, I work with professional exhibition designers. They're usually architects. Mm -hmm. um, so the process are I will have a concept, and I would discuss with them. And if this is realizable, and of course they would also contributing ideas. Um, and I, again, like, I think my exhibitions uh, tend to be very narrative oriented and they serve as stories. Um, so I like to have a very distinct route where people could navigate through the exhibition with um, a very sequenced, um, you know, deliberation. I think, I also like to think about space and exhibition as a theater in the way um, and how, you know, there are certain sort of atmosphere and ambience and mood that you would be able to evoke as you go through the exhibition. So it's very important to me that there is the intellectual, cognitive, um, literary content, but then there's also this visual, sensual um, and experiential um, experience that people walk through the exhibition and I one thing like I really like to think about is if you are making you know if you want to tell a story if you want to say something um, can you say it in the in, as as a as a, if you can write a book why make an exhibition so, right like this is very important to me um, if it can be self-sufficient and sufficient enough to just be a book and then perhaps this doesn't need to be an exhibition. And then if it has to be an exhibition, then it must be very different and distinctive from why, you know, it's very different from a book. Um, so again, even storytelling is very different, but it's a different way of storytelling um, than writing a novel or short story. I do like to collaborate also with people who tend to think outside of their specific um, I guess, um, discipline. Um, so I don't know if I, speaking about exhibition design, I don't know if there's, oh, for example, you see this green um, plastic strip on the side. This is a design by the exhibition designer, uh, which I was really happy about. So we use a lot of sections like this to block certain entrance and also to determine the route. So deter people to enter because the factory building is so um, lambrous. So there's like ways you could go and then you will get lost. Um, mm -hmm. So we installed these that people just would prevent them to enter. So you really just have one way going straight. Um, and the materials and the other colors are, you know, a collaboration with the designer to figure it out. Um, so there are things like that. Um, and I want to go back to the floor plan, maybe. So yeah, that was see. my yeah, question, because uh, I'm in interdesign and I have a several students from the interdesign program as well. And I recently did a survey for the narrative environment as the exhibition spaces to see the, how people are gonna perceive the space based on the narrative or intended narratives we or creator uh, design and propose. So I was mm -hmm. really curious about you were uh, approaches. <laughs> yeah, so basically, I think what I got was, you know, when I first got the floor plan, there was nothing in there. Um, and then the first step is really have an understanding with the exhibition designer and architect, which walls can be dismantled, mm -hmm. and which walls can stay. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then you started to get an idea of, you know, the spatial relationship between each exhibition area. And then we designed the route and also getting an understanding of where the entrance and the exits are. And then we and, and started to express to them that I would like to have one entrance and one exit. So there's no, you know, go around. And then they presented me a few options and said, this is the route that you could go. So we ultimately decided that people would enter from here and go here. And then they would turn around and Mm -hmm. then exit around here. But as you go one way, you don't know that you will be able to turn around because this is the big open space at Uh the back. So that's where the mirror corridor is also where you go through all these very claustrophobic, narrow, you know, almost oppressive Mm -hmm. stage of the exhibition while we were talking about violence and the horror of technology and all this. And then you go through this mirror and all of a sudden everything opens up. There's this big room, big space. Um, And then you loop back where, you know, the exhibition enter a different mood. Um, So towards the end of the show, it's much more celebratorial. going back to focus on humanity and also sort of a human itself that to say things that we don't need a superhuman, um, you know, humanity itself is beautiful. So the show actually ended with Adrian Piper's piece where she was dancing in the Alexander Plaza in Berlin, like excess- excessively for hours, where she was just listening to the disco music herself. Um, and danced as an aged woman, right? Like, so this is kind of a celebration. Um, Yeah, I think it's mostly just a very close relationship with the architect. And I really like to work with designers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very interested. Well, actually, I'm very surprised that you came up with a certain narrative and storytelling from the beginning to the end. And you have a very strict and concrete concept to deliver the certain messages through your exhibition, which was really uh, fascinated to me. We thank have uh, one, more, uh, one more question here from, uh, uh, thank you for your insightful presentation. I was wondering what you as a curator think regarding artists and their art. Do you think of them as separate or, or the same? It seems difficult when gathering so many different artists and their work to give sufficient background or personal narrative of the artist. Do you, do you actually can see the, the, the questions? On, on the, the, the relationship between the artist and the artwork? Is that the question? Uh, how you think as a curator, uh, yeah, artists and their artwork, yeah. Yeah, I think it really depends on the context. Um, I think it's very different um i would say that it's a very delicate relationship as if you're working with the artist on a personal or solo presentation or more it's a group exhibition and i don't have a preference of either i think i really i'm interested in working with artists for a very focused solo presentation versus a a very kind of discursive thematic oriented presentation. Um, I do, however, uh, think that the relationship between artists and artwork is very complex, especially with living artists. It's almost impossible to separate the two, um, even though, you know, that um, I would think that oftentimes um, when the artwork is leaving or has left the studio, it starts to have its own life. Um, and I think artists also tend to have very, uh, you know, strong control of how their work is presented. But at the same time, this control is almost illusionary in a sense. Um, and I don't think that, you know, the interpretation of the work and the understanding of the work can be controlled or should be controlled. Um, there is, of course, intention intentionality as why the work is create, created and what's the inspiration behind it and what the artist intend to say. Um, but other times I think these is just the starting point. It's the mere starting point of how an artwork is being understood and then be interpreted. Recently, I also read a lot of writings on Kandinsky, um, which, you know, is a very interesting 
example, because I work mostly with living artists, but then you have artists who are dead um, and then le left all these artwork behind. I would pretty much say the interpretation of Kandinsky's work is half correct, half incorrect. If you really want to match his own personal intention of why these work were created, I was thinking how much Kandinsky would actually agree on how people are talking about his work right now. Probably not so much. Um, there is a very interesting American read on her, his work that is very different from, let's say, like a Russian context or, or, or Russian background um, and people generally usually tend to think that his work is universal and have this abstraction and also this universal language and trying to evoke some kind of a personal you know um, feelings because he also talk about synesthesia where he see you know uh, hear sound as he makes these shapes and others but then other sources also um um, articulated that Kandinsky actually doesn't really care about his inner expression at all. He actually really used abstraction as a instrumental tool to his intention was to educate the audience. It's much more exterior than interior in terms of this expression. So I don't know, like these are all now become, you know, speculations and there is always the mm, tyranny of interpretation, I would call it, because it is often being controlled by the powerful and the wealthy, um, especially in the art world. And also, we would say how the tyranny of history writing is similar, uh, where, you know, the truth seems to be only um, handled by the powerful one. But then is that the only narrative, right? It's usually just one of the narratives. I think, uh, uh, let's have one last question uh, here. Uh, Bo Young Cheng has a question. She, uh, she liked to speak to you. So um, I think uh, then we're gonna, we're gonna end this presentation. So yeah, sure. yeah, go ahead. So thank you for your great talk. And I just wanted to hear opinion about uh, like globalization, uh, how it is uh, defined as of today. So, like as you mentioned uh, at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned about like the museum funding, like where the money uh, comes from, and then also a sense of like expanded sense of nation. So for me, it's like um, uh, uh, more like uh, it's no more like showing Chinese art uh, abroad, but. Uh, Exhibitions on Chinese art is kind of acts of re-territorializing China and presenting uh, like a re declaration of China in a more expanded uh, uh, territory or control or something. So I'm just wondering that like how this uh, globalization today, as of today, it affects the way China is defined and presented in international uh, art scene. So do you see any, like, yeah, do you have any thoughts or opinions and, or like how we could uh, define like globalization of like, Asian art as of today? Yeah. Okay. yeah, I think it's a very good question. Um, I, definitely think that this issue is many folded. I think like for this very specific, um, very specific uh, presentation or initiative of the Chinese Art Initiative, it was also a very interesting mandate from the funder, right? Like um, who um, still coming from this intention of thinking that more exposure would create more understanding. So it's this really diplomatic kind of uh, policy level cultural exchange, in my opinion, that, you know, reminds me of the 70s or, you know, all these ping pong policy or diplomat sort of uh, ways of making people understand each other. Um, and on the one hand, I really feel like these exchange, this understanding need to be more because just consider now, again, the rising tension between the United States and China 
and there is like more misunderstanding, more speculation, more uh, terrorization against each other, um, you know, more propaganda. It's crazy because I also hear my all my families are still in China, so my mom would watch these news that the Chinese portraying American, <laughs> like in a very propaganda sort of hatred way. And then you would also hear all these, you know, informations here when the Americans in the news are portraying Chinese and all this. So on the one hand, I really feel like these exchange needs to have more. But then on the other hand, uh, we need to find the new ways of doing it. That's for sure. I feel like these kind of identity-based, the cultural pigeonholing kind of practice is actually creating more misunderstanding or um, reinforces its stereotype in a way. And how can we, I think it's really, um, you know, have to do more of the system and the infrastructure of how the artists are being situated and positioned. For example, I personally would think, you know, artists like Cao Fei or Wang Ping, their work is so international and they, you know, they could easily be uh, presented and have a follower that do not need to have any particular so-called understanding of China. That also like, I think the old way of educating the audience to have a pre-knowledge is very patronizing as well, right? This is also a kind of imperialistic residue of cultural policies in this country, to be honest. Um, I think there are two twofold. One is that, and one is the foundational myth of identity that shaped you know, everything about this country. So I think it's the two things that in, in woven into each other and with each other. Um, so I think I really feel like the topic of globalization, globalism, local and, and, you know, global is not outdated or should be abandoned, but it has to be presented and interpreted and, and, and positioned in different ways. I think it needs to, I think the art, artist and the artwork can totally speak for themselves. It doesn't need to be branded, it doesn't need to be put into a, a sort of a box. Um, so these are some of my thoughts. Yeah. It just reminds me of uh, the uh, article that I recently read. So Hiroshi Sugimoto, he's lived in the US for like 30 years, but he's still categorized as Japanese artists, and he's always discussed in the context of Japanese tradition and art, even though he is more like, has more global and international identity. So it's like, um, like irony of uh, speaking about an art or artist from a specific culture. So yeah, it's kind of twofold. It, yes. I yeah, definitely. Thank All you. Right. Great. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Boyong Chang. Uh, Actually, Bo Young Cheng is uh, is uh, is one of our close friends. Uh, she's currently a researcher and faculty at the University of Chicago. We'll have a presentation in February online on uh, uh, CAA uh, College of Arts. Uh, I'll invite everyone here. Uh, our <laughs> online event. But thank you, Shayu. Um, thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, we've learned a lot, and you have an important role. And um, as a curator, also introduced as a you know, uh, Chinese artists and global artists uh, to to the mainstream uh, people or or uh, people in general. I wish, uh, yeah. Uh, if uh, for those who have more, I I have more question, but for those who here, <laughs> uh, please email me our collect and 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 send it to Shayu Yuan. <laughs> yeah, and uh, come to visit me when you guys have chance to stop by in New York. Oh wow! I yeah. mean, it's a little difficult right now, but <laughs> I'm sure it's gonna get better. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have yeah. a good evening. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for.